Good afternoon and welcome to this panel on information warfare in cyberspace. Now, I'm completely aware, and so all of my panelists, that this is the last thing keeping you from the dinner overlooking beautiful Bay of Tallinn. So I promise it will be fun. And also, in the good spirit of modern communications, we've decided not to each lecture you for 90 minutes each, but rather open up for discussions quite early on in the panel. It's an exciting and diverse crowd of speakers I'm fortunate to share the stage with today. So we'll be going from planning and sort of almost military doctrine issues to the fundamentals of how to tell a good story and how to make sure that your stories are fit for your audience. And we'll in many ways take off where uh, Professor Martin Lebicki left off this morning. So in the end, it doesn't matter whether we talk about information warfare, uh, strategic communications, public affairs, or anything else. All of this is about changing psychologies, changing the ways people feel about you, what people know, what people, how people experience things, and in the end, how they behave towards you, how they take action. And if that is, as Professor Lebicki pointed out, inconsistent with our theory of warfare, well then, it is the 21st century out there with its highly complex and multi-layered world of communications. And therefore, if our theory of warfare is not consistent with it, then maybe, just maybe, it's about time to reconsider our theory of warfare because the modern world of 21st century of communications is not likely to reconsider itself. And in my experience, the greatest failure of nations in information warfare or against strategic communication, anything else you want to call this, getting your point across, uh, painting a picture of the world that helps you achieve your end purposes, whether as a nation, as an organization, or an individual, is that we've come to compartmentalize. And instead of thinking how do you get our point across so that an audience acts, behaves, and thinks in a way favorable to us, is open to the narrative we're promoting, a lot of energy has been spent on the academic yet completely futile exercise of classifying things as information warfare, psyops, public affairs, press relations, or infops. And that's just not how human psychology works. Human psychology in the end, each of us individually, but also target audiences, take on a much more complex view. They think of how they've experienced what you do. They think of the stories you tell and whether that forms a consistent and comprehensive whole for them, which is why, why it's so important you have different points of view and different backgrounds on the panel today. We're going from doctrine and how to conceptualize information warfare and cyber and how they interact to great storytellers and communication planners. And I've, I've promised each and every one of my panelists that I'll run them off the stage if they speak for more than about eight to 10 minutes in the opening statements which means that we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions from the audience. I'm very much looking forward to a lively discussion. So without further ado, let me introduce my colleague from the NATO Cooperative uh, Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, Major Pascal Prangetta of the French Army, who's a legal researcher and who together with our Dutch colleague, uh, Matthijs Venendal has written a paper and will talk about influence cyber operations and how those two concepts feed into each other. Okay. Thank you for the kind presentation. I think you all know me now. Uh, but firstly, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for having me and for, for selecting this paper. <laughs> it's very gracious of you. Um, well, yeah, before we start, this research paper that I'm about to present to you uh, I co-authored it with my colleague Matthijs van Endel, and you can find it in the Proceedings book. Uh, it, doesn't reflect NATO, it doesn't reflect NATO position. It's only and merely thoughts that we have gathered 
to frame uh, the problem of information warfare. Uh, since, I mean, this morning we had uh, the opportunity to listen to Martin Lubicki, and in a way I'm gonna pick where he left off. Uh, well, it's just ambitious, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do that. So the topic today is, oh, sorry, yeah, trying to frame the issue of cyber attacks and influence operations. Uh, when we try to write this, um, this article, we were confronted with so many definitions. Information operations, information warfare, psyops, et cetera, et cetera. And we were not sure where cyber and influence operations would interact. So we came up with a simple distinction, which might seem uh, arbitrary, but we said, okay, on one hand, we would say that they are inform and influence operations, uh, what Christopher Paul calls the apples of information, that is content, propaganda, uh, use of social media. This would be inform inform and influence operations. Information operations, we kept it uh, from the military doctrine, uh, mostly from the US perspective. And in the middle, mostly happening during peacetime, so below the threshold of, the, uh, of, of an armed conflict, uh, from the legal standpoint, from the international law standpoint, there's what we've called influence cyber operations. Um, and we try to distinguish what would be the main features, and this is where we end up with this definition conundrum. So, to put it in a nutshell, the definition of uh, an ICO, an influence cyber operation, would be an operation that represents a technical challenge. That is to say that it's uh, an operation conducted that affects what we call the logical layer of cyberspace, or what Martin Lebicki calls uh, this syntactic layer that enables data to go from point A to point B, uh, and typically it's hacking. To, to, make it, uh, uh, to make it simple. And the primary effect of these actions are to influence or to uh, modify the behavior of a targeted audience or to modify decision-making processes. And why it matters? Because this is something that is becoming more and more prevalent. It's happening every day. And I will go later and explain uh, through examples and case studies uh, how, it, how it can play, and how we can actually identify a primary, object, uh, a primary effect that uh, entails influencing a, targeting, uh, a targeted audience. So why it matters? First off, because given that these actions, uh, such as defacements or DDoS attacks, are very, very low tech, and they do not amount to an armed attack in the legal sense, that is to say that it's not cyber war at all, um, there is no risk of escalation. So it's very hard, if you're a victim of that type of operation, to actually uh, respond. That's the, the first thing. So it's very easy for the adversary or for your aggressor to actually use that in, in, a, in a peacetime context. Secondly, um, given, of course, we talked a lot about attribution this morning, and it's becoming more and more easier, but on the other hand, use of proxies, uh, the difficulty to really relate from a legal standpoint, uh, an actor, to maybe his, um, uh, the person who gave the order, uh, there's a lot of plausible deniability. And we'll see that also through the example of uh, false flag attacks. So to, yeah, to uh, visualize that, this is how we felt uh, cyber operations and influence operations would connect in the middle and become ICOs. So give, uh, regarding the examples, uh, I've chosen three. There are more in, in our article, but so hacking, f first and foremost. Uh, there was a case study um, uh, that was written in an article in uh, one of our uh, publications at the center regarding the Russian aggression in Ukraine and the cyber aspects of that, uh, of that aggression. And uh, there was a hack regarding the Central Election Commission. It was not a big or important attack, but it was modifying the data as to say that the real-time results were, uh, were modified and thus could have actually created an influence effect. And this is how we, we defined it. Secondly, uh, we talked also about the OPM hack, but of course uh, the OPM hack was an espionage campaign. But we considered with Matthijs, with my co-author, that secondly it also had an influential effect because it created this embarrassing effect, or 
undermining the credibility of an adversary. These are like little stings in, in, your, um, in your defensive uh, um, uh, posture. Uh, especially when Michael Hayden that it said that it was actually a huge embarrassment. Secondly, false flag attacks. The, uh, the example uh, we have is this uh, TV5, TV5 Monde attack uh, last, um, uh, that happened in April 2015. And months later, a report by a private company, I think it was FireEye, said that actually it was not ISIS that was behind uh, the uh, TV5 Monde attack, but it was um, a group called APT28. Why would someone actually um, uh, frame another actor in, in, in cyberspace, and especially through these, um, these, these small attacks? What are they gaining from? So they're creating con confusion. Uh, we were also thinking that through that, with this TV5 Monde attack, uh, there would be an influence on, on, on the public opinion. But uh, no, we could not measure that uh, um, in, a, in a specific way. My third type of example is um, something that is becoming uh, um, like a real category called doxing. So doxing is the public, uh, the leaking of documents, uh, whether it's corporate or an individual level, uh, level or political. On a corporate level, you all know the Sony hack and uh, some uh, of the corporate secrets that were leaked in the press, uh, for example, the Snapchat uh, uh, um, acquisition project by Sony, um, and that was revealed, uh, created some turmoil on, on the stock exchange. Uh, on the individual level, John Brennan, the CIA director's uh, personal email was, was hacked, or even professional email was hacked, uh, creating this sense of uh, insecurity. I mean, if John Brennan's account is hackable, then that means that no one is safe. So uh, that was another uh, uh, issue here, and we considered that this type of attacks were influence cyber operations because there was uh, firstly uh, an intrusion, computer intrusion, and then um, there was a leak. Most of the time, these attacks cannot be systematized in the way that it's a lot of opportunity. I mean, uh, for instance, the Newland leak uh, during the Ukraine crisis when the conversation between uh, Victoria Newland, uh, from, the State Depart from the US State Department with the, U the US ambassador in Ukraine, uh, talking about, in very coarse, coarsely about U EU uh, in regards to the um, Ukraine crisis. Um, this revelation did not have a lot of effects, but it could have created a larger divide between EU and US in regard to the response that NATO and, and uh, should have had uh, towards Russia. So these, these examples, and of course, I did not include uh, website defacements, which are typical uh, um, uh, influence cyber operations in our, in our opinion, and of course, uh, DDoS attacks. As, as an example, uh, you remember that in 20, uh, 20 for 2015, uh, NATO underwent a series, uh, series, uh, series of attacks uh, undermining its credibility that was conducted by this group uh, called Cyber Berkut uh, from Ukraine, a pro-Russian pro -Russian group. So, to conclude very quickly, uh, these activities are very, very low level. They're, they're on this lower spectrum of, of, um, of cyber operations that we are observing today. Uh, one would say that, uh, like uh, Thomas Reed was saying, these have uh, vis visible effects, but they have this paintball effect. So it looks like it's important, but it, in, in the end, it's not that important. And that, w that is why better awareness uh, is, um, is advised. Uh, the other thing, and how to respond to it, and how to better um, uh, counter and thwart these, these small threats, uh, is beware of the low-hanging fruit. That is to say, patch your vulnerabilities, uh, promote cyber hygiene. These are very, very simple. And we were also talking about the fact that um, a lot of these events are sometimes overblown and labeled cyber war, especially through media that are looking for, and as an example, I uh, would uh, quote the example of the Sancom Twitter account that was hacked in 2014 by ISIS, or the Cyber Caliphate, sorry, that was a Cyber Caliphate, and it was talked about a lot and reported massively in, 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 the, uh, in the media when it was just a simple defacement on a Twitter account that could have been uh, either hacked or just uh, uh, someone had breached the password. So in, in the end, our conclusion would be just to move along <laughs> and there's nothing to see. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Pascal, for setting the scene. 
And if there's very specific questions to make sure Prangetta, we can take them right away. But it is my intention to move to a bigger discussion that uh, focuses on constructive solutions to the scene that's being set quite early in the, in the session. So our next speaker now speaks about the particular part of the scene that Pascal has set for us. And Drew Herrick is from the Washing George Washington University. He's also a non-resident fellow at New America, and he will talk about social media and cyber ops and how those two feed into each other. Thank you very much for the introduction. Okay, uh, so this talk comes out of the proceedings paper, so there's much more detail there. So I'm gonna give a brief overview of basically two things. First, what is the relationship between social media operations on the one hand and cyber operations? And second, how should we think about social media operations more broadly? There we go. So we've seen the rise of social media activity, social media operations. We've seen it domestically in the form of campaigns. So lots of election campaigning. We've seen domestic crime. We've seen domestic activism. At the international level, we also see international activism, international crime. We also see foreign governments and even international organizations that are prolific on social media. Uh, but more interestingly for where, kind of where my background is, is we also see it within conflict zones. We see lots of social media activity. We see it at interstate conflicts, so conflict between state actors. This can be conventional warfare, this could be hybrid warfare. We also see it at the intrastate level. So you have rebel groups that are actively using social media. You have government officials that are using social media to both deal with domestic threats and to counter broadcast against rebel groups. You see social media playing a big role in post-conflict reconstruction. So how should we think about these things? First, what is the relationship between social media operations and cyber operations? Uh, so there's two key approaches that people usually argue for. The first is that, well, social media operations is just another example of cyber capabilities. If you say that an actor has a cyber capability or that it's cyber powerful in some way, well, social media activity could be one example. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between that. Um, the, second thing, uh, the second approach, which I find somewhat more compelling, is that actually social media operations and activity aren't a direct example of cyber operations but instead they're a good proxy. It's very difficult to measure cyber power. It's very difficult to measure cyber capabilities. There aren't very good public indicators. So one example you could use is, hey, if you have an actor that's prolific on social media and they're gauging these public acts on social media, then maybe this is a good proxy metric for how to get at their cyber capabilities. The assumption underneath both of these approaches is that the same technology and the same set of skills that you use for social media operations also translate to cyber operations. Um, so my argument in the paper and here is you should be very skeptical of these claims uh, for several reasons. The first reason is that cyber operations and social media operations, they're dealing on very different scales. You have very different networks, you have very different network effects, and you're trying to achieve very different things between the two sets of operations. The second thing is skill. The skills you need to do social media operations are very different than the skills you need for cyber operations. For social media operations, if you just think of traditional counter-messaging or broadcasting, you have a pre-established tool, it's ready-made for you. You don't need to know how that tool works, you just need to how, know how to deploy it. Whereas for cyber, it's very different in the sense of you need to have a very tailored attack. You need to understand not only your own capabilities, but the characteristics and capabilities of your target. And defense matters. The, the defense has agency, they have countermeasures, they're learning, they're reacting to you. And this is very different than what's going on in social uh, media operations. And the third thing is that actually these two sets of operations are trying to achieve antithetical things. They face antithetical problems. And there's two examples of this. The first is access. For social media, access for many platforms is by default. You don't have to overcome restricted access. You have a direct line of communication, you have a direct channel to your target. Whereas in cyber, the key restriction you face is you have restricted access. You have to attain and ultimately maintain access in order to deploy and use your cyber capabilities. And these are two separate, very different types of problems that you have to deal with. The second example is awareness. If you think of counter messaging and broadcasting again, you're using the network effects of the specific platform to magnify your voice, to magnify your operation, magnify your influence. Whereas for cyber operations, you're trying to do the exact opposite. You're trying to be very narrow, you're trying to be very targeted and very covert. So the skills here don't seem like they translate that well. Ultimately, I think there is a relationship between social media and cyber, uh, but I think it's a negative relationship. I think that probabilistically, it's more likely that if an actor is highly active on social media, that they're actually making themselves more vulnerable to targeting, not less. 
So the first way to think of this is cyber ISR, so intelligence surveillance reconnaissance or OPE, operational preparation of the environment. By engaging in social media, adversaries and actors are selecting into giving their adversaries a capability that they wouldn't otherwise have. You're broadcasting information that can be used for targeting, used for access. And you're also expanding the attack surface. Social media can be used as a command and control, or it could be used as another direct channel for delivering a cyber capability. And both of these things, you're actually giving your adversary a set of tools to harm you or hurt you that, you wouldn't actually, uh, that they wouldn't actually have the capability to do otherwise. Okay, so how should we think about social media operations? Well, first, it's not an asymmetric advantage. A lot of the narrative and a lot of the discussion around social media says, hey, look, these non-state actors are being highly prolific on social media. They were doing recruitment. They're doing broadcasting. Clearly, this is some sort of technology that's privileging them and harming states. But when you actually look at all of the cases, states are using these technologies also. There are intelligence agencies using them. Even militaries are using them. And it's bi-directional. By using social media, once again, you're giving your adversary this capability. So there are certainly trade-offs. Maybe there's some advantage to be gained by doing things on social media and being active, but there are certainly trade-offs that need to be acknowledged. The second thing is don't just think counter-messaging. When you read a lot of the coverage of this, when you see elites talking about it, if you see people in the State Department, they're thinking, okay, ISIS is using social media or these rebel groups are using social media broadcasts to recruit. We need to counter that message in one way. Uh, but strangely, if you look at information warfare, prior to social media, counter messaging is only one thing out of a many uh, long list of things you can do. And for some reason, we forget about these other types of things we can do with social media. So first is just information gathering. You can do passive monitoring of the platforms that your adversary is on. You can use that for targeting. We've seen this in the kinetic realm, where you actually see ISIS uh, supporters using social media. And then within a 24-hour period, the Air Force is actually using that information to guide a kinetic weapon. The same thing holds for cyber. You can use all of this for targeting purposes. Second is defensive operations. Here's where counter messaging fits in, but you can also do threat intelligence. You can do active monitoring to protect your own systems and see what your adversaries are doing. And the third thing that never really gets talked about is you can actually do offensive operations. You can deny, disrupt, degrade, destroy your adversary's capabilities. You can do command and control for your weapons. You can do um, offensive cyber operations through social media. And this is a part of the discussion we need to think about, because we want to know what's permissible, what should we be doing, what should we legally be allowed to do, what are the norms around this sort of space. And all of the conversations up to this point primarily focus on counter-messaging and maybe a little bit of information gathering. And the third thing is you need to properly identify the target set. Social media isn't a unified entity. There are very different platforms with different attributes. So you need to think about the different attributes of those platforms. Does the platform have end-to-end -end encryption? Does the platform have chat bots? Does the platform have a large network? Are there identification measures? How easy is it to filter out spam? All of these sorts of things play a big role in how successful your operations are. And you also have to think about the group attributes. There's been a lot of discussion about the technical proficiency of, group, of groups, but you also want to know about their proficiency of that specific platform they're using. How long have they been using it? Have they switched platforms recently? What about group cohesion? Does every member of that group know every other member of that group? All of these things have huge impact on ultimately how successful your operations will be. So this creates a framework with action type. And ultimately, action type, the effectiveness, has to go through the platform and the group. And this all has impact on effectiveness. Importantly, there's also a relationship between the group and the platform. Depending on the characteristics of the platform and the characteristics of the group, some groups may be more or less vulnerable depending on which types of platforms they're using. So to fill this out a bit, we have our three different action types. We have some platform attributes. Is it public by default? What are the entry costs? What is the type of content? How permanent is the content? We have group dynamics. How competent are they? Are they even aware that they're being surveilled? Are they strategically trying to misinform you? What about size of the organization? What about oversight and command and control? Is there actually some documents or doctrine in place within these organizations that regulates what their group members can do on social media? And ultimately, all of these things play and have a huge effect on the effectiveness of your given type of operations. So to conclude, I have some recommendations I want to talk about. First, don't default to restricting the internet or services. A lot of the times you see where in conflict zones, militaries come in, they shut off internet access, they completely take out services. Really, you're taking a capability away from yourself. 
What you want to do instead is disrupt your adversary's ability to use that capability successfully while maintaining your ability to do information gathering, defensive operations, and offensive operations. The second thing is properly identify the target set. There's no one solution that fits everything. Just like in cyber where you have to tailor your specific actions and tactics to the characteristics of the target, you have to do the exact same thing within social media operations. Third, consider social media operations at all echelons, across all levels of war. For some reason, there's this tendency to think that it's just intelligence services in the rear, or it's just happening at the strategic level. I think there's a lot of value at the operational and tactical level that's being overlooked. And the fourth thing is, we need new doctrine. Who has command authority over these types of operations? Does it fit into cyber? Does it fit into traditional information operations? Does it fit into PR? Or is it something completely different that needs its own set of rules? And the th thing that I want to conclude with is, there's been a lot of discussion about international norms for cyberspace and actions within cyberspace, but something that's overlooked a lot is what's happening on social media platforms. We need to have a real discussion about what's permitted and what should be allowed for actors to do within conflict zones in these sorts of areas. Thank you. Thank you, Drew, and particularly thank you for pointing out that, as always, to be effective, you have to pick the right horses for these, the courses you're trying to race on. And, and that, in the end, is the question. And whether that gets classified as PR, public affairs, stratcom, or something else, might not be as relevant. Next, Yanis Sartz has been on both sides of the world we're talking about today as the State Secretary of the Ministry of Defense of Latvia. Obviously, he's seen some pretty high-level decision-making, and he's promised to share some war stories. But Yanis also has been in charge on government level of the defense of Latvian cyberspace. So those are the war stories that I hope won't have you wait until the dinner later this evening. And today, he's the director of the Riga-based NATO Strategic Communication Center of Excellence. So, Janis, the floor is yours. And you tell us if this dichotomy that's been laid out to us of information and cyberspace operationally actually makes sense. Well, uh, thank you very much, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, well, let me start from a different perspective. When I talk about the cyber, I immediately uh, visualize a picture of a computer and a person sitting at a computer. Why? Because that's how you understand what it is. It's not only human, and it's not only a machine. It's both together in interaction. And when we speak about information warfare and its current new phenomenon, it's much about that interaction. And sometimes when I see people looking at this problem, they take a look either from a technical end of things, either purely from a human social sciences end of things. But the real picture you can get when you combine the two. For instance, if you think about the conflict, we, we would think about uh, the tools, how to employ uh, it in the cyberspace, in the connected world. But if you think about at the, what's, if you boil it down, what is the conflict aims to achieve? It aims to achieve the change of behavior of the other social group, society, nation, to do whatever is necessary. How do you achieve the change of behavior? You know, normally that is, of course, what we do in a conflict with a kinetic means. Now we're transferring some of it through the cyber effect. But after all, all of that is meant to change the perception. Because from the way you perceive the world, you base your actions. And then, once again, how do you change the perceptions of people? And there, you know, nothing is really new. You do it through logos, pathos, ethos. So logic, the least effective of the tools, emotion, far more effective, and the 
social proof. Who is telling that to you? So these elements are still all there. But then the question is why we're talking about cyber. Is that because of new development of this world and all, most of the humans migrating their social interaction, the place where they receive information, the place where they get the perception of things, the whole concept is now being reapplied. But because of this new environment, it gives you absolutely new possibilities. The reach, ability to individualize the message, ability to actually understand, I would say, not the targets, but the audience. The audience, and through that understanding, send out the signals in a way that affects the perceptions, through the perceptions can affect uh, the behaviors. If you talk to any of the large marketing companies, there's no any more such product as a, general, a generalized marketing campaign. The marketing is being done for me, you, you, and you. That's reality. It has not yet transferred, as Professor Lubitsky said, to the information warfare, but I see it soon coming, is that there will be a capacity to produce the, the information that is meant to shape your perceptions of things, probably by an adversary, to you specifically. And then again, you might have seen it in, and I would say most of us live in a modern information bubbles. It has been a normal tendency for a human being because our interaction circle is somewhat limited. But the point here is that in a modern digital world, your bubble becomes the networks within which you function. Facebook, Twitter, are all LinkedIn, all the communities. But the point is, if you get the penetration in that, uh, in that bubble, you would not have the same resistance to, to sort of being suspicious, uh, suspicious of the outside information influence, there you have your trusted circle and you are much more susceptible to persuasion. And there are technologies developed by the marketing companies to, to actually get into that bubble. So that's the picture by and large. Then the other point I wanted to bring is the element of, of cyber attacks uh, being an element of a larger narrative. For instance, if the narrative that you, uh, the opponent is trying to say is, you're a weak nation, you're a failed state. And that comes from media, from public officials, you have a number of other things. Then, obviously, if you think of the possible ways how to substantiate your argument, you can choose a cyber attack as a signal as a signal, not for the effect of taking out the electricity, but actually was a reason to send a signal, we were able to do that, therefore, yes, you're a failed state, you're an access, not successful, so don't support that government. So this kind of logic, and, and I think there is a, quite a lot of uh, overlap, and some of the uh, war stories that um, I remember when we were uh, the uh, chair, chairing nation of uh, EU, uh, the, the presidency of uh, EU, and I had to run the cyber security for the country. Obviously, we were expecting to receive some attacks during that half a year period. It was a lot of discussion about Ukraine. There were fights and, and war there, and, and some important decisions had to be made. For instance, one of the attacks that happened, and in Latvia, uh, the government meetings are televised live. Not many watch, but you know, journalists certainly do. So what happens at the moment where the government meeting starts, starts the televised version, you get a DDoS attack in exactly the time when it starts on that government site. Obviously, it's a cyber attack. It is with all the elements, very simplistic. I would agree with that. But the only reason it takes place 
to deliver a message. Well, fortunately, it was not successful because it's technically not that sophisticated. It was easy to pre-plan for that kind of option. But here I would also put another point and link is actually, if you understand the intentions, the way you would be thought about by your opponents and what kind of effects they would want to create, you can actually more focus on the areas that they might actually try to, to attack. Of course, it's only one proportion uh, and one of the rationales for, for cyber attacks. There are far many others as well, obviously. But certainly for the ones that are meant to create an informational effect, by understanding the, 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 the rationale, you are able to actually pre-prepare for the response. Uh, the other notion I, I would also want to bring uh, here to this discussion is that um, at the end of the day, as, as Professor Lubitsky asked, who is going to be the first one that would deliver the full-scale information uh, warfare capability to the battlefield? And my conclusion here now is I'm afraid that will not be us. And I'll give you the rationale. Of course, we have by far the technological superiority. Either we look at the, at the technological part of the house, the, 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 the software, et cetera, uh, experts, or at a human science or marketing part of the house. But the problem is, and even if we look at the social, uh, at the political campaigns, we have a lot of tool sets. But by the nature of our societies, we always limit our ourselves within these realms. For more authoritarian leaders, that is one of the basic elements they want to control. They want to control the perceptions of their own people. And that's where they develop their capabilities. And that's why I think, most likely, they'll be the first ones that would have actually the full spectrum of the capabilities in the information warfare. For us, what I think what we have to do, and, and I would concur to some of the conclusions I've seen before, we of course have to, uh, to, to prepare. We have to prepare for these circumstances. We, we, we have to do some baseline work. I'll not uh, develop on, on that here. But certainly, I think in this human computer interaction, I think the first and foremost thing that we have to synchronize the way that we analyze the phenomenon, both from human sciences and from the technical sciences. And referring back to President Ilves' parallel of two cultures, we have to merge these cultures. For me, also, we're doing our job in the social networks, analyzing, et cetera. That is one of the hardest sort of skill set that comes by both understanding of social sciences and the technical piece, technical sciences. That is something that we need to develop to be successful to counter information uh, warfare. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. And, <laughs> and uh, thank, you for, thank you for two kind reminders. One is that we do need to understand and translate between these technical and social worlds that you painted a picture of. And secondly, that any effect in the end is about behaviors and actions. And next we have Peter Pomerantsev, who's uh, from the Legatum Institute, who's a filmmaker, a storyteller extraordinaire, and also an award-winning author, who most recently was honored with the Ondatje Prize. And I, I have learned your name, but the name of the prize will take me some time to be able to not put sure for his book, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, for its intricate and delicate and deep understanding of the Russian society. So Peter has promised that he will talk about cats on the internet as well as Homer, and not Simpson, but the more ancient one. <laughs> and how do you tell stories that in the end end up changing behaviors and creating action? The floor I, I, is all yours. Yeah, I don't know if I can do the last one. Maybe we'll leave that to the debate. It's always very hard being last in a panel because 
everyone gets up and takes away your arguments. And I've got this piece of paper, I'm like cross talking out, crossing out. Brilliant presentations, I thought, all of them. Um, and, and especially, I think, Yanis's point that, um, yeah, this is actually somewhere we do have an asymmetric disadvantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the ISIS's or, or the Putins of this world, which is not a nice thought. But I want to go back to something that Lisa said right at the start, this idea, do we have the right language to talk about war? Um, and one way I've tried to imagine this for myself is um, to go back to Homer, you know, the ancient Greek poet. And um, uh, maybe the one way of thinking about this is the difference between the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, the Cold War was a lot like the Iliad. You know, on one side you had Soviets, on the other hand you had the West. On one hand you had Greeks, on the other side you had Trojans. Uh, you kind of had a wall in between. There were deception operations. You know, the Trojan horse uh, is a huge and very successful deception operation. Um, you know, you could say that um, uh, Perestroika, some hawks like James Shear say Perestroika was a deception operation. Soviets would say that um, uh, the US space program, Star Wars, was a deception operation. So lots of deceptions, but a very clear kind of them and us, offense, defense, and, and kind of very clear lines of winning, you know. Now we're kind of out of that world. I think we're now in the world of the Odyssey. Now, go back and reread the Odyssey. I have a nine-year-old daughter. I'm reading her the Odyssey now. Um, the Odyssey is a story of a man, Odysseus. Who here remembers the Odyssey from when they were kids? <laughs> yeah, come on. You've seen the tea. You see, you've seen the cartoons. So basically, Odysseus, the hero of the Trojan War, is trying to get home. He can't get home because he's completely and utterly attacked from all sides by various weird deception operations, yeah? He ends up on weird islands, which turned out to be illusions. He spends five years there. There are sirens, like Russia Today or something like that, which <laughs> completely distract him to another place. There are, uh, meanwhile, his son, Telemachus, back in his home country, which he can't get to, is completely and utterly angry and embittered at him, a bit like sort of millennials or occupy people in America. Uh, his home country is completely corrupt, like, you know, much of the West has become since the Cold War. Um, Reread the Odyssey as a story about deception and not being able to find out the truth. And because you can't find the truth, you can't orientate yourself in this world and you get lost. And essentially, I'm going to focus on Russia, uh, because I know a little bit more about that. But what Russia tries to do to the West nowadays, they're not trying to, you know, win an ideological battle. This is one of these sort of absolute fakes they put out there to distract us. This is the siren's call of pseudo-conservatism. It's a complete ruse. We should ignore it. What they try to do, it's not an information war. It's a war on information. Put out so much disinformation out there, so many conspiracies out there, that we, as democratic societies, can't function because we can't have a dialogue, can't respond to them, and end up, you know, wandering about in this uh, medieval mist of misinformation. Now, in a way, this is an attack on the whole epistemological principle of enlightenment, deliberative democracy, where we have to have an information space where we can agree on the facts to build policies and have a, you know, a, a real democracy. What they're doing, I think, is very insidious. And it's very insidious, especially because they're just going with the flow with what is happening in the world anyway. They did not invent it. They're just going along with it. The information age is becoming the disinformation age. The information technologies that we thought would empower democracy are starting to eat away at it. So I'll give you a few examples. Google. Yeah, there's a great book by Michael Lynch, who's an American philosopher, who talks a lot about the meaning of the need for truth and reason in democracy. Google, he answers, is destroying our ability to think in a rational way. Yeah? The whole idea of Kant, of John Locke, was that in order to think empirically, you had to do research, debate, look at the evidence, and that's what built your rational capabilities. Now you just Google now. You know, like, you know, you Google it. And then you choose the information you want. You retreat into this information bubble, yeah, that Yanis was talking about. There are so many types, there's so much information out there now that people have started to say, well, you know, the facts, you know, the truth, that's just another narrative. You hear this in a lot of places. Um, you have your truth, I have my truth. We used to think that more information would mean better decision making. Actually, we can't seem to be able to, be able to cope with the amount of information and therefore, uh, you know, are retreating from sort of a rational, reasoned debate. Now, one of the main tools we use to try to deal with this is fact-checking. So as this information has been rising, 
we've seen this boom of fact-checking across the world. In America, you have organizations like PolitiFact, which try to you know, keep up with Donald Trump. Um, the EU has now got its disinformation review, which tries to keep track of Russian disinformation. It's happening throughout the world. It's a very natural response, you know. Certainly facts will win out, and maybe facts will become really technologically fast. You know, maybe we can uh, use widgets to catch out um, politicians on their lies. Google experimented with this idea of a truth algorithm. Yeah, so when you Google something, you wouldn't get some conspiratorial clickbait, which is what you might well get now. You'd actually get something from the BBC. They never put this into action, but, you know, it was an idea. DARPA uh, had a project where they thought they could uh, call it the science of social media. I love DARPA. They, they make everything sound like an adventure. Um, but basically, you know, they, they claim that they could uh, predict a way that you can you know, tell a disinformation meme before it gets going and nip it in the bud. Again, hasn't been acted upon, but again, this, this endless myth that somehow the internet can, you know, that the power of technology can empower facts and rational thinking. I think there's a really big problem with all this approach. I think we have to look at the deeper emotional structure of social media, the emotional structure of the internet, and then we realize it's rigged against rational thinking. I've got two minutes. I'll wrap this up very quickly. So, incredible place in Luca, the Institute of Advanced Study, have been looking at emotional narratives, yeah? uh, how emotions react inside social media echo chambers, inside social media bubbles. And they found that the more time people spent on social media, whether these guys were conspiratorial, rational, academics, neo-Nazis, it doesn't matter, they all got angrier, nastier and angrier. And they think there's a psychological reason for that. We go to social media looking for likes. It's a narcissism machine, yeah? We go there looking for self-confirmation. Huh? We can never quite get it. We want more. We can never get it. We get angry and frustrated. When we get angry and frustrated, we start looking for the narratives which make us happy again, which confirm, which make us feel stronger than we are. So we look for the narratives, not which are true, but the ones which suit us. Often those are conspiracist narratives, because that explains the world. Usually makes you a victim, makes you feel better. Excuses yourself. So there's a loop here between narcissism and the search for disinformation. Therefore, kittens, one of the few things that can knock out your anger and frustration online is the sight of something which you feel stronger than and that makes you feel pity. That's why kittens are all, are all over the internet, why this bizarre obsession with kittens online. So if we're going to start dealing with the disinformation age, we're going to really have to start understanding the emotional warped narcissism that the internet is making, uh, making us into. And that comes back to Homer again, because, you know, narcissus is a Greek myth. I'm just going to talk down the last 24 seconds. I finished my point, and I'm just going to talk for 20 seconds. I've got to talk for 20 more seconds. Okay, I'll stop. In preparing for this panel, Peter promised me that every time he mentioned Russia, he'll do an animal impression. <laughs> yet we, yet oh, we only no. got tonight. pictures, tonight. Uh, pictures tonight. painted of kittens, which we all appreciate it. No, we do. I think, I think I, I'm sorry about that, but I, it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late. Uh, but there are, do you keep this discussion focused on solutions? Mm. And I very much would like to carry now on with what is it with the world that we've described in cyber and information operations? What is it that nations and international organizations can do? There's a couple of rules of the game. One of them is do not mention the Russia. <laughs> because the basic of any sort of communication is that if you frame the conversation, you won the conversation. And that's a trap that, as was demonstrated by all of the panelists, Western nations and organizations have walked into day in and day out. And the moment you're playing their game, it's like playing chess with only their chess pieces on the board. You've lost already. So let's not, anyone in this room, let alone anyone on this stage, can give a 90 minute talk of what Russia is and what Russia does and be entertaining. But let's save that perhaps for the social event later this evening. And which <laughs> brings to the second point. Let's focus on solutions, let's focus on what can be done and what we are in control of. 
So my first question is this paradox of deliberative democracy that several of you alluded to and then uh, Peter quite eloquently pointed out, which is the idea of democracy, the basic value that the international organizations that we're members of is based on, which is the basic constitutional value of most nations represented in this room, would actually be an asymmetric disadvantage in that it makes us slow, makes us not agile, makes us not be able to throw things at other nations the way other nations are throwing things at you, at us. So the obvious solution here, and that's the philosopher's solution, is to talk about Popperian critical thinking, but, and some of these tools Peter pointed out, but how do we do it? Based on your experience and your research, what are the very practical things that nations, and in particular nations and political players and national decision makers can do so that the cyber information operations or social media operations or whatever we call this communication from the dark side doesn't just snow us under. How do we empower the populations to be able to deal with this environment? It's his job. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, okay, but uh, if I may start <coughs> first, I would slightly question this, uh, the notion that we're more or less doomed. I think one has to, to, to be at disadvantage. I think one has to qualify. Our opponent's approach has, gives them a lot of tactical advantages. But strategically speaking, we're still the ones that are generating better lifestyle, better um, individual freedoms, better ambiance. Strategically, that's the winning card. And that's the opposing sort of parties trying to attack. And th the very reason they develop these methodologies, in my view, is actually to make sure their own societies are not compelled to follow that pattern. That's the reason. So there, there is a how? technical how? And, and then strategic. So why I describe it? Because I think it's important to, to distinguish and because also, therefore, the, the, the answers. But basically, the, the basic answer is simple. Is we claim to live in the information age. We don't equip societies with the knowledge and tool sets to exist in that environment. It's as simple as that. Uh, I would say in the, you have to start in the very early days in the school, and not because of propaganda, but because of many other things. Start, train to understand, educate to understand, distinguish information. That's that's first thing. Second thing is, uh, as I've said, for, uh, underst uh, for understanding the phenomenon, you have to bring to the analysis two elements of the house together, which we, as it was being referred earlier on, we claim to, we, we continue to have this pipeline thinking, the, the techie here, the human science here, and you know, the, the, well, interact very rarely. I think that is the thing that we have to do more and more. Third is, in fact, we have to think start to think of the human networks in the same way as how we think of the technical uh, critical infrastructure networks. Because obviously in the societies, there would be the places which would, would, would enable to change the discourse of the given society, the opinion, more than any other. So one has to protect and ensure that outside sort of uh, forces are not trying to, to impede into their normal interactive process by trying to steer them into that direction. We have to start thinking in, in these kind of terms. Um, just a few things. <laughs> and again, to the rest of the panel, how do we do that? A simple person, do you hands ten fingers? How do I go about doing that, as anyone else in the room? Well, I mean, I work in media, so um, I'd love to know some of the more technical things, but there's a paradox here, because we're talking about trust, really, we're talking about how do you restore trust. There's a paradox here. Um, on the one hand, we have this 
combatant, you know, the, the, this disappearance into echo chambers. Um, and I think we had to work. We had to understand that, you know, all the work has been incredibly targeted to very specific groups. There's a very interesting project being piloted in London. I think I can talk about it publicly now by the Institute of Strategic Dialogue called One to One, where former jihadis, uh, I can talk about ISIS, can't I? Former jihadis uh, go online um, and, you know, through various quite simple search functions, they find kids who are becoming um, uh, radicalized online and do this kind of one-to-one -one work with them, and that's super targeted. They kind of approach them and say, hey, I hear you want to, like, you know, create a single caliphate. I understand Muslims are very humiliated. I used to want this too, but, you know, it's not as great as it sounds. Do you want to talk about it? It takes a long time. This is, like, really targeted work. I mean, a bit broader than that, once, because social media gives us so much information about people, how they consume, what their search preferences are, what they like, that does mean that we can create public information campaigns which are incredibly targeted. Average Muhammad uh, in the US is a really good example, uh, which is a really super targeted cartoon at, you know, at risk young people who might be sucked into uh, radical Islamist um, ideology. But the problem is, and here's the paradox, is that while people disappear into these echo chambers, and we're going to work on the echo chambers, that's not actually helping bridge trust between the echo chambers. So the question is, how do we bridge you know, the trust between these disparate groups? Um, Estonia, I think a very good example of that, where you have like a, a subset of society which lives in a slightly different echo chamber. We can, we can, we can work on that echo chamber. Uh, I'm not mentioning which one it is, because I'm not allowed <laughs> to. But, um, uh, but, but that doesn't help restore an overall sense of a public space and a shared democracy. So that's where I think we have to reinvent public broadcasting. Public broadcasting, especially in Britain, the BBC always had that role. In the US, it was more like papers of, newspapers of record had that role, the New York Times or something. They, they kind of created the space for a public discourse. They used to do that by simply giving a golden standard and trying to be fair and balanced and above the fray that the BBC doesn't get involved. That doesn't work anymore, yeah? because if you're just above the fray among 300,000 TV channels, you're just another TV channel. The only way we can build trust is by getting people to work together. I mean, everyone who's tried to build a team knows that. You've got to get people active and doing something together. So weirdly enough, I think the public broadcaster of the future will be an activist broadcaster, uniting bits of society around, doesn't matter, fixing road, health issues. Not just reporting on it, but creating campaigns around it, lobbying, getting legislation changed, uh, really helping people to unite in causes that are, are of interest to all of them. Uh, so on the one hand, really targeted work with echo chambers. On the other hand, reinventing public broadcasting. That's the two things I would focus on. Yeah, so I want to take a step back. Um, so who's the actor who's doing these things? It seems that people will be very skeptical if you have the US military, the US intelligence services trying to do these kind of convincing persuasion activities. It seems like that's very good strategy for NGOs. Um, but if you have the US military engaging these things, there's already this trust deficit. There's already this built-in skepticism. So there's one set of strategies that make sense for one set of actors. Uh, but I want to focus on kind of the military intelligence agencies for a second. Um, so here I think that it's, what is the purpose? What is your objective? Um, so it seems unlikely that you're going to be able to persuade these target actors to come over to your side. Instead, it seems like there's good research that really what you want to do is provide whoever the target audience is, some set of material incentives, some set of security or control, and then link that with your narrative. And that's a much more, uh, per, that's a better persuasive story, but it also provides some sort of material incentives. And I think that's something that NGOs aren't really well placed to do, but that governments are better placed. If you're doing counterinsurgency stuff, then there's lots of good coin doctrine on how to conduct these sorts of things. When you add in some of the information stuff, then maybe it becomes slightly more effective. Um, and just one thing, taking a step back. My understanding was the first person who mentioned that state that shouldn't uh, be named has to buy us drinks. I know, so, I'm, I'm, I'm into an animal impression, but I'll buy you drinks, it's much simpler. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to kind of reiterate from my talk that this is all about counter messaging and information operations, but that's only a small subset of what you can use a lot of these things for. So if your adversary is conducting these information operations, then by definition, they're revealing things about their um, technical capabilities, about their actor attributes, all these sorts of things. You can use those for targeting things. So even if they're winning some sort of informational campaign against you, they're still revealing things that you can use in other ways to your own advantage. Skala, states ready to do any of what was described here? Uh, well, or are we still stuck on doctrine? Actually, they are. I mean, France is targeting uh, social media to uh, locate uh, uh, 
terrorists or uh, I mean there, there's a part actually where they are doing some de-radicalization but there's also another part which is more military for intelligence uh, purposes where they actually try to locate uh, where these people are and uh, yeah and this is a, I mean, this is a way to respond uh, to one threat in the information space um, the I mean, when I was talking about this influence cyber operations, uh, from a democracy perspective, it's difficult for a state to actually engage in, 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 in cyber attacks and in, in, uh, penetrating and uh, publicly admitting we're penetrating uh, uh, foreign, uh, um, foreign information systems or we're going into newspaper feed and uh, feeding uh, fake information because we're under the empire of transparency and, and, and values and we are thinking that these values shall prevail and I think Yanis is right. Uh, in, in a way, they could, they will, or they might prevail, uh, but on a, in the long term. Uh, on the other hand, um, military intelligence also engaged sometimes in uh, certain operations. I have this example in 2011. MI6 actually conducted a defacement against uh, that was the uh, website of Al Qaeda, and uh, it was called Operation Cupcake. So there's, there was this uh, uh, Al Qaeda review where they were. Uh, giving an example of how to make a bomb, and they replaced it with a cupcake recipe. So it was the uh, Dabik, no, Dabik is uh, Al, uh, ISIS, so I don't remember the Inspire. That was the Inspire magazine uh, from Al Qaeda, and, and they defaced it. Of course, it didn't last long, and I don't think it did have a lasting effect. But this is the kind of thing that could happen in order to undermine the credibility. Mostly, if you're doing that, it's just to undermine uh, credibility, sow confusion uh, with, with your adversary. In this world of naming things being the things, I love how special forces name their operation. Cupcake, <laughs> really now. Or how we name our exercises, my favorite being by far NATO exercise dynamic mongoose, because that will really make you take the, them seriously. And one of the things that in cyber and then in information warfare we talk about a lot, and that came up almost with all of you, is attribution. And I, playing the devil's advocate, would argue that in having agreed that the effects of communication matter and the effects, the most tangible, quantifiable effects, would be those of action or behavior. You know, the number of people who join Dash, or the number of people who decide to not join Dash, the number of people who buy your running shoes, whatever it is, the number of people who watch the public broadcasters that Peter was talking about, then the, all of this goes back to the target audience, and in that, the aggressor becomes irrelevant. You have to understand their patterns of communication to be able to counter them, but their identity, because you're, you're not focusing on them, you're having to focus on your target audiences, on your populations, or on your decision makers, or particular parts of your population, then why do you even care? And the same in cyber. If you keep your network safe, it doesn't matter whether it's a talented 13-year-old, a terrorist organization, or another nation that's trying to get in. So why do we even talk about attribution? Why is it relevant? Why do we talk about the source of the other narrative? I'm not sure if I entirely understand your question, but I'll tell a little story anyway. <laughs> so this is from, this is from the, um, I think we're talking about the same thing. So, the thing that you mentioned, some actors will be trusted and some won't. I mean, instinctively, that is true, and I'm sure that is true in a lot of cases. But it might, you know, just to sort of further that debate a little bit. So, again, this Institute of Advanced Studies in Luca, they were looking at health, people who believe in health conspiracies on the Italian internet. And they found that the people who believed in them, when the World Health Organization would, for example, say, we need more vaccines because there's a danger of a pandemic, they would start going, evil, evil World Health Organization, you know, they're run by Big Pharma. When the World Health Organization would say that cancer leads, uh, red meat leads to cancer, they would say, great World Health Organization, because they, a lot of them were vegan, because they're, you know, vegans are conspiracy. No, a lot of them happen to be vegan, uh, but they all believe that, you know, you know, evil companies were putting chemicals into, into meat and that was giving us cancer. So suddenly they love the World Health Organization. Uh, again, when I talk to people who work with jihadis, it, they, it really, what matters much more is how you frame your approach and understanding your audience. They often say quite openly, we're being funded by, you know, the government, la, 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 and they're quite open about it. Because people actually don't, they don't trust anyone anyway. 
And so it's much more important how you frame your approach and how you frame your conversation, which is about understanding them. So I think we get overly concerned about this, 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 you know, this panic about attribution. And often we blame our failures, like, oh, nobody will believe the government anyway. No, they will believe the government if the government knows how to talk to people. So does attribution matter? Well, in fact, uh, if we look at the, the one of the key methods of the in information warfare that can be described as creating information fog. So what, what Peter just talked, uh, talked about, about a lot of conspiracy theories, uh, competing facts about reality that are not linked to actual reality, but trying to, to make the perception of different things, self-competing sometimes. Very good case, the MH17 shutdown, uh, where a lot of competing conspiracy theories were earth. So why fog? Because in a fog, you don't understand what's true, what's not. When you don't understand, you stop act. It's like in a normal fog, you just stop. You don't know the direction. So it's important to give out the parameters for where you are. Of course, to have ability in that fog to give parameters, you have to have trust, which is sometimes the issue. But still, that is one of ways to give out the parameters to the larger audiences. Once you have the parameters in a foggy environment, you start able to move forward. So therefore, it's important. Yeah, uh, so I guess I'm like the token skeptic on this panel. Um, <laughs> it seems like stupidity and kind of a lot of the stuff is systemic of a lot of culture. And I'm not sure that like framing your argument in the right way is going to convince a lot of groups. It seems like there's a lot of entrenched ideas that you're not really going to be able to convince them to come over to your side. The best thing you can do is employ other strategies to prevent them from harming you in certain ways. Uh, so I think that like conspiracy theory stuff, maybe we're out of luck there. But there's probably a small set of areas where you can kind of come to a common ground, assuming you have common working definitions, some sort of place where you can actually compromise in some way. So I think getting better at identifying what it is that the other side wants, and not our characterization of what we think they want, but really, what do they think they want? What's their understanding? And how close to that can we get? What can we give them? And what are they able to give us? If we think that we're interacting with strategic actors who are actually rational in some way, then there's probably some bargain we can come to. Maybe it's not the ideal situation for both sides, but it's better than whatever the status quo is. Um, my fear is that in a lot of instances, there's places where there's just no bargain to be struck. Um, and then you're kind of out of luck. Like, it doesn't matter how you frame your argument. There's just no leeway on either side. And then you have to think about other options and say, OK, so maybe these sorts of influence operations are off the table. What can we do instead? So I think that we need, need to get much better at identifying where these sorts of operations can help us and then where we need to jettison them and actually go back to other sorts of operations. It's definitely true, uh, true that it's, it's, again, you have to pick your battles in communication, not just the target audience, but your battles. Academic work done on conspiracy theories and anti-vaxxers in particular also shows, so this, this particular piece of research started with, can we use scientific uh, argumentation to get that? anti-vaccination people to get to vaccinate their children. Turns out scientific evidence, so logical argumentation, draws them to be more skeptical. Next, they tried emotional stories, stories of children who would have done a lot better had they been vaccinated. Again, turns out the anti-vaxxers hearing these stories became more skeptical of vaccination. <laughs> so finally, we, they, they went to opinion leaders, so ethos, mm -hmm. pathos, and logos. Well, Surprise, surprise, turns out anti-vaxxers, when countered with opinion leaders who tell about the usefulness of vaccines, become more skeptical. So part of this is choosing your target, mm -hmm. your messaging, your ways, but also your target and understanding that some battles are very hard to win. With that, are there any questions from the audience? The tall gentleman up front. <laughs> Thank you, Senzako, uh, CCDCOE. About the um, social media bubble, um, meaning that we are all reverting back to villages. Uh, I think you have all, we have all in Facebook um, uh, hidden those friends who are, 
whose annoying views we don't like, but not so much that we want to argue with them. It's just better not to see. So basically we see information what we believe in, uh, and if you have it on a national global scale, that means that we're all getting kind of tribal. Um, and Lisa, as a moderator, wanted uh, you, know, you guys to be uh, focusing on what is to be done, or what are the kind of solutions. I have heard one solution, which is releasing more cat videos. Um, mm. Is there anything else which kind of, you know, I'm, I'm sure, Yanis, you have a, a you know, you, your organization is shooting cat videos and you know, disseminating that. <laughs> but otherwise, that's because you say the people like reading things what they, they know is true because of their tribal inclinations. Um, uh, uh, there is a case probably that it's good for social media networks because you can target the at group level advertisement. If you have a group on NRA, you can show gun pictures there and sell guns. So, and, and you don't waste that advertisement on a tree hugging organization mm -hmm. and so forth. Meaning that it's lucrative financially, it's psychologically comfortable for people but at the same time, of course, at the society level, they're getting angrier and angrier and angrier. So what is to be done? Thank you. Confir how do you Vaccination. We need to vaccine them. No. no, no. <laughs> how do you um, overcome confirmation bias? So I'll give you an example from, I think it ties what you guys are talking about and what you were talking about, about choosing the battles, understanding the audience, and what you can do. You're quite right. Often you just can't get through the vaccine stuff. You can't get through a jihadi's head. There is no point of dialogue there. I'll give you a story about uh, Odessa very quickly. So a big country next to Odessa tried to, um, you all know where Odessa is, a town in south, southern Ukraine, over 100 ethnicities, 44 TV channels, um, 50 newspapers, completely tribalized among Turks, you know, Gagos, Bulgarians, Russians, Ukrainians, you know, a real kind of globalized city. Um, and a country next door tried to stir these tribes who all live in their little echo chambers, don't trust each other, they tried to stir them into civil war. You know, there was some, a terrible fire there, and they started saying that one of the social groups, the Ukra pro Ukrainians had, caused a genocide of the pro-Russians, constantly trying to, you know, the logical, the, logical final, the logical final point of what you're talking about is civil war. You know, all these tribes will start fighting. So the local people, the local people who understood, who did information policy, who were very, very clever, because they understood their own city, and they knew that the country next door had actually hadn't understood the city. That despite all the ethnic rivalries, what people really cared about in Odessa was at a very deep level sort of security and economic freedom. I guess everybody does, but they're particularly so. It's a city which you know, was captured over and over in the Second World War. You know, this is part of Ukraine, the bloodlands of Europe. People have a really bad reaction to kind of you know, dying for a cause. Uh, Odessa also has this myth of being an, you know, a free economic town, or dreams of being Singapore or Hong Kong, much more important to it than ethnic rivalries. And so all the advertisements they put up had nothing to do with nationalism, with love Ukraine. They just put up advertisements saying, support for separatism leads to an, an adverts of what happened in the Donbass next door, which was carnage. And that was enough, people going, no, we don't want that, we don't want civil war. So basically, all they did was really understand the deeper desires of people and acted upon that. And I think that's a little key. You know, we have to kind of go deeper than whether they're tree huggers or you know, National Rifle Association people. Maybe they both love McDonald's, and then we focus on the Big Mac. Well, in fact, I would say there's a key to every door. Sometimes it takes a long time to find the right key, and the thing that behind the door is not worth the time. But there's still uh, a key for every door. So in the same way, there is a key to, I would say, most of humans, how to get to them. Sometimes finding the key probably is not worth the time that you actually penetrate that. So in that sense, I would say, yes, you have to pick your bottles. And, but the other point in there is that you have the capacity to get into these bubbles. You have. How? Uh, you have to understand the motivation mm -hmm. sets, the behavior sets, and then you have to do a lot, a lot of research. But you can. The question is: Is the are these bubbles all the time that mm -hmm. uh, that important to 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 spend all that time? And do you have the resource to do that? 
I, I, I'm not sure we, uh, we have, although one can do uh, prioritize the bubbles. As I've said, there might be the, the key groups within the networks that are able to lead the other bubbles into the certain directions to which you address your effort to find the right key. But there is a key to every group, in my view, uh, even to the GCARDs, but uh, probably very small and very hard to find and sometimes very different to different uh, of these groups. But there are always motivations behind why they are there. Probably they were personal, more, more generalistic, etc. Uh, the other point, I think, is also um, that I wanted to reflect, uh, re responding to you, Swan, is um, in the morning there were discussion of, of how useful the data is. In fact, for, for human science or understanding the human interaction, this is the first time you could actually quantify so much human interaction in human history. So there's a lot of new potential knowledge out there. And currently, it is being used mostly by the marketing companies mm -hmm. to achieve the results they are after. But that is still there, and we're just not using it. Should we always use it? In what cases we should use it? Can it be seen as legitimate? That are all of these questions out there. But the potential is. So do you, the skeptic, can nations overcome these bubbles? Can the defense establishment overcome these bubbles? Yeah. Um, so if you buy that you can kind of pair social scientists with military organizations or with intelligence organizations, and that that's an effective uh, merger, then maybe you can identify the key to unlock, unlocking these sorts of groups. Um, but I guess I'm also skeptical of that claim. Empirically, when you look at things that have happened kind of in Iraq, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. even prior to that, when you pair social scientists with these sort of organizations, there's lots of bureaucratic reasons why it doesn't work. There's lots of ethical, um, philosophical disagreements. Um, even once they come onto the same page and they try and agree, then a lot of the data that they're gathering, it's kind of suspect. Um, some of their methods are questionable. And ultimately, even if you somehow come up with the inner working or data on the inner working of whatever your target audience is, uh, then you still have to come up with, okay, is this even a solution we can implement? And I would assume that in a lot of cases, you're going to say, well, this is what their inner working is. We know that if we can change our policy, we could get them to come to our side. But ultimately, that's not a policy decision we are comfortable making. And at that point, you're kind of back to, well, this isn't really an option we have anymore. So I'd kind of echo back earlier to my comments about just get better at identifying which kind of campaigns you can win through this sort of method versus which campaigns you can't. So come up with some sort of quick metric of, is it worth investing the time and resources on this specific problem? Mm. Or is there some other menu, like we have a larger set of options, right? So this is just one tool we could employ. What about the other tools? Is a, there another tool that is more effective for this specific targeted problem, or that's cheaper, or going to achieve whatever our objective is in a faster manner? I think that the ideal solution would be we get better at making that sort of decision. We come up with a quick heuristic of deciding what's worth our time and what isn't. And if we can do that, then that's a huge step in terms of progress. Uh, more questions from the audience? This is a lively crowd. It's been fun playing <laughs> to you, Tallinn. <laughs> I mean, uh, the tall gentleman in, uh, up front needs a microphone again. Follow one question, Yanis, to you, maybe because uh, you said yes, you can, you know, it's always a key and so forth. Uh, whose job is it? I mean, uh, you're not talking about government injecting itself into a um, social bu bubbles, trying then to change the people's behavior with finding a key, all those kind of things. So, who, I mean, we're talking about not basically what one should do, but who? <laughs> well, um Therefore, the uh, last part of my answer, there are a lot of questions on the legalities, uh, responsibilities, and, uh, and these kind of things which are not sold in my view, which have to be because, as I say, that is available for the commercial purposes with a limited interest impact. It is being done. So, in a way, I, I would assume under the current legal sort of construct, it could be possible to do into the your defined opponent's
camp for the specific agencies that have the legal authority. But it's to try to apply the existing legal frameworks to the rather novel possibilities. Whether that's the right way, I'm not sure. Within your own society, it's absolutely only, I think, only uh, the, the interest groups, le legitimate interest groups that can, can do that. But that's my opinion, and it's just an opinion. I think there's not been a proper debate on that at all. Cool. I, I think um, there'll probably be a range of actors, because we're democracies, but um, I think a, a leading role, uh, certainly in terms of providing funds, should be from social media companies. Uh, and internet companies who um, have created this mess, who profit <laughs> from this mess, who use it, um, and who at the moment do a public relations minimum in doing something about it. Finally, they've agreed with EU regulations about trying to do something about hate speech on Facebook and, and, and other platforms. Uh, that happened yesterday, I think, but we'll see whether they can, you know, you shut down one hate Twitter account, then three million more pop up. They're not, I mean, my sense is they're doing a minimum for the PR. They're very worried about a case in Germany. Facebook are very worried about this case in Germany, which will say that because there's pro-Nazi hate speech on Facebook, they're not a platform anymore, they're a media, which means they get taxed differently, which means that they have utterly different responsibilities. So look, no, Silicon Valley, I think, is, is the big new player. Mark Zuckerberg says he has four billion to spend on projects. How about he spends it on cleaning up the mess he's created? Uh, Pascal and uh, True, I mean, you spoke so much about where this sort of activities in a defense institution, a defense organization could fall. Can it fall there? Or is it that because of how human psychology works, defense, the defense organizations are fundamentally incapable of doing information operations, information warfare? I'd, I'd like to respond to, to Peter's comment regarding the uh, I mean, controlling the content on, 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 in, on the internet, I, I think it's, it's mission impossible. You cannot control hate speech, etc. And in, in my view, it's mostly a great leveler. And some studies show actually that people are tending to, to go with the majority. So there might be a minority view with all these hate speeches and, and outrageous positions, but apparently uh, through social media, there's also a sort of self-restraint. Uh, in expressing uh, extravagant ideas, uh, etc. So, uh, I, I wouldn't actually agree that um, uh, Facebook or, or Twitter should be removing this because maybe uh, in the long term or short or medium term, uh, the, uh, the content will be actually self restrained. I, I mean, that, that is to say that there's a sort of common majority that is creating, which is not good in a way, because uh, the, the, the opinions are not expressed today. True. Uh, cool. Yeah, I guess I'm deeply uncomfortable with the idea of a government or military organization or intelligence organization going to the social media companies and telling them to deal with this problem on their behalf. It's unclear what that mechanism would look like. Maybe it's regulatory, but maybe it's something else. And that's just a path that I don't necessarily want to go down. And even if you do get them to willingly do this sort of thing, I think that going back to kind of how I started off my conversation, maybe that's not the strategy you want to actually do. Maybe you actually want to leave a lot of these things up and running so you can monitor them for intelligence purposes or for offensive purposes. So once again, we're only focusing on one aspect, and this is the way that the narrative usually gets shaped. Hey, we should shut down these accounts. Hey, we should not allow them to be active. Hey, we should counter message. But there's actual value to leaving these things up and running, and there's some more recent work on this that looks at how citizen organizations have been monitoring these things, kind of policing themselves, and that sort of thing. And in fact, shutting accounts doesn't work. Uh, our uh, research on Daesh very well uh, sh shows the, a number of adaptive technologies, uh, methodologies that they uh, do to actually counter that kind of approach. And it's quite clear that shutting down communication channels just drives information. And then there's the, oh, you shut it down, but I can still Google it. I think a lot of thought, uh, a food for thought here, but one of the things that's been universally agreed across the panel is that communication cannot be about communication. It has to be about effects. It has to be about changing behaviors. It has to be about changing 
uh, actions and attitudes. And similarly, we take a similar no-nonsense approach to gardening in Estonia. <laughs> so, <laughs> growing your basil, and I do believe that every single joke that can be made about growing your own herbs has been already made on this stage. <laughs> so, we do believe that growing your basil is about getting basil, and therefore, here's a smart herb garden that's very effective in doing that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> this is the first useful presence I've had from a conference. <laughs> Thank you. Get you. A conference and you just... What's the informational effect of sending images of plants to people? That's, uh, well, enrages them. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, genocidal. <laughs>